Chapter 221 God Extinguishing Slash As Anduin's talisman and the spirit-binding snake took effect, the werewolf wizard began to act. He advanced with the werewolves, seizing the opportunity to destroy a thunderstorm ball. Simultaneously, he waved his wand, casting curses at Anduin. When these spells were launched, the metal magic balls surrounding Anduin, which he had activated moments earlier, lit up with magical lines. They intercepted the curses like mosquitoes drawn to blood. With a buzz, the metal balls released layers of transparent shields, blocking the incoming curses. One particularly powerful thunderbolt explosion shattered two protective shields, but the metal ball quickly generated a new one, absorbing all the damage and aftermath. These attacks couldn't even ruffle the hem of Anduin's clothes. Anduin called these metal balls Lincoln's Spheres, his most recent and proud alchemical creation. Initially, he intended to create a magic floating cannon that could automatically detect enemies and launch cluster lightning for auxiliary attacks. However, he found this concept impractical and difficult to execute. Determining an enemy's presence, whether by temperature, malicious intent, or counterattacking after being hit, proved challenging. If someone accidentally triggered it, the cannon might fire randomly, becoming a hazard. Moreover, casting spells was problematic. Wizards channel magic through their wands, ensuring spells remain condensed after leaving the source of magic. Spells also require an eye lock at the moment of casting, containing the caster's will and intent. Without a wizard's control, alchemical creations might not cast spells accurately. This is why the wizarding world has few alchemical items that can automatically emit spells. Alchemical items can release spell effects around them and produce spells under a wizard's control, but they cannot cast ballistic enchanted projectiles autonomously. Faced with these challenges, Anduin created an automatic defense floating ball. While locking onto enemies was difficult, locking onto attacking spells was feasible. To enhance its defensive capabilities, he used high-quality materials, including an ounce of Ulam steel, making the sphere resistant to the killing curse. Additionally, it featured an energy-absorbing spell rune, which could absorb magic power and replenish the iron armor spell rune when under attack. He tested that every time three layers of armor curse protection were broken, the magic ball could replenish the magic power required for one layer of armor curse with the energy-absorbing spell. It could also autonomously absorb free magic power. With Lincoln's sphere blocking the werewolf wizard's attacks, Anduin could focus on dealing with the remaining werewolves. Initially, there were 11 werewolves, including the werewolf wizard. Four had been eliminated earlier, and one was crippled by the spirit-binding snake. Now, only five blind werewolves remained. Two of them, despite their blindness, relied on their sense of smell and advanced towards Anduin at a fast pace, waving their sharp claws determinedly. Anduin knew, knew it was difficult to break through the physical defenses of these werewolves. Anduin knew that ordinary spells wouldn't suffice. Even though the Shen Feng Wu Ying spell could inflict wounds that wouldn't heal, it wasn't a quick solution. He needed to kill in one hit. With this in mind, Anduin quickly mobilized his magic power. The elder centaur behind him felt a frightening wave of magic emanate from the young wizard. It was a magic imbued with a pale, desolate air, suffocating and heavy, like tons of weight pressing on his chest, making him almost forget to breathe. Silver-white electric lights began to circle around Anduin's wand, dark painting, spreading along the wand, up his arms, and enveloping his entire body. Even his pupils glowed with a silver light, and his hair stood on end, crackling with electric sparks. The werewolf wizard, standing twenty meters away, felt the terrifying aura erupting from Anduin. An om, Inno's premonition, gripped him. He quickly fired a killing curse at Anduin, but Lincoln's sphere, standing beside Anduin, transformed instantly into a metal round shield, blocking the Avada Kedavra forcefully. Anduin remained unscathed, the shield quietly standing between him and the werewolf wizard. Seeing this, the werewolf wizard groaned inwardly and took a few steps back. His sixth sense screamed at him to flee immediately, or it would be too late. Only a few seconds had passed, and Anduin had completed his energy storage. As Anduin raised his wand, the werewolf wizard's heart stopped in terror. He quickly raised his wand to apparate and disappeared from the scene. The remaining werewolves weren't so lucky. God, destroy! Cut! 
ping, 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 ping. Five loud noises echoed through the forbidden forest like thunder. The sound was intense but brief, shocking all the animals within a few kilometers. So fast, so loud, so bright. The elder centaur, who had been staring at Anduin, had only these thoughts in his mind. He felt as if he was about to be blinded. The moment Anduin cast the spell, five consecutive strong lights flashed, intense and short, like the sudden dawn of a new day. When the elder centaur regained his vision, he saw Anduin drenched in sweat, panting heavily, and gulping down a potion. The five werewolves who had been standing moments before had turned into black sculptures, like charcoal. A strong wind blew, and the five black sculptures disintegrated into wisps of scorched black dust. Hiss! The elder centaur and the few centaurs behind him who were still awake gasped. What kind of powerful spell was this? If they had faced this curse, they wouldn't have had any time to react. End of this chapter. Chapter 222. Firenze. Huff, I didn't expect the five consecutive whips of lightning released by God's extinguisher to consume so much energy, almost draining all the magic power in my body, Anduin thought with some fear. Fortunately, the werewolf wizard fled quickly. Otherwise, he might not have had the strength to fight back in a short time. This spell was developed by him some time ago, and he hadn't even had the chance to test it properly. He just wanted to test the spell on the werewolves. It was effective, but it almost backfired in the end. However, the power of God's extinguisher was beyond his imagination. After studying day and night during this period, he discovered a special property of the Wild Thunder Rune, its high compressibility. As long as the magic power is sufficient, the lightning energy can be compressed almost infinitely, increasing both voltage and electric power. According to the memory of the Thunderbird he had gleaned from the rune, the Thunderbird that flew into the storm absorbed a large amount of electric charge into its body, forming such a function. After discovering this feature, Anduin came up with the idea of developing God's Extinction Slash, infinitely compressing the magic text full of wild thunder, or injecting as much magic power as possible into the extremely compressed magic text. This formed the spell he called God's Extinguishing Slash. Theoretically, the power of this spell is infinite and could even kill gods. Simple. Rough. Rough. This was Anduin's evaluation of it. He had compressed and converted 90% of the magic power in his body into the wild thunder runes. When he hit the enemy, what consumed the most energy was actually turning around and sending out a few more slashes at the other werewolves. The output of magic power was extremely fast, and the release speed was almost instantaneous. From when the wand was released to when it hit the enemy, it took almost a blink of an eye. But during this period, a lot of magic power was wasted, like hitting a mosquito with a cannonball. The damage was overflowing. This was mainly because the magic power output was too fast. The sound and light effect of God's extinguishing slash was also very intimidating. Anduin himself was startled. His eyes were a little dazed by the flash, and both ears were now experiencing some tinnitus. But to compress magic power and runes, one needs strong magic control, which is mainly affected by the sensitivity of magic power. Most wizards can't achieve this, and if you spend all your energy on controlling the compressed magic power, there's no way to control the output of magic power. This is why he was so exhausted. Anduin blasted out 90% of the magic power in his body in one second. It seems that if he wants to use this spell proficiently in the future, he must balance the control of compressing the magic power of the wild thunder and the output of magic power. Only when this balance is well grasped can it be used routinely. After drinking two bottles of tonic, Anduin finally recovered a bit and then glanced at the battlefield. The five werewolves had been reduced to ashes, which once again proved the horror of this spell and how much mana output was wasted. The werewolf wizard had escaped with apparition at the moment of his attack. Counting the four werewolves killed before, ten of the eleven enemies had been eliminated, and the remaining one was controlled by his spirit snake. The werewolf had also fallen to the ground in a coma, with the magic power in his body basically exhausted. This werewolf was specially left by him. He needed a living person to understand the situation of these werewolves. Then Anduin glanced back at the centaurs. Under the care of the elder, most of the centaurs had regained consciousness. 
The wounds on their bodies had stopped bleeding, indicating that their lives were no longer in danger. Cheeky! Anduin called out into the distance, then slowly walked towards the fallen werewolf. In an instant, Cheeky, the house elf, apparated beside Anduin. Master, you are incredible. You defeated all these terrifying monsters with just a few punches and kicks. And that last spell of yours was so powerful, I thought it was dawn, Cheeky exclaimed, looking at Anduin with admiration. All right, enough flattery. Let me ask you, why didn't you tell me that those werewolves had something as dangerous as the blood madness potion? Anduin took out a pair of enchanted handcuffs and secured the werewolf. He then used a spirit-binding snake to gag the werewolf and continued questioning Chi-Chi without looking back. The master didn't ask before, and I can't recognize all the potions in the cargo box. I don't know what the blood madness potion is. I'm sorry, master. Did I do something wrong? Chi-Chi nervously rubbed her little hands, looking at Anduin with a worried expression. She was about to kick a stone in frustration, but remembered her master's previous order and stopped, leaving her with a conflicted look. You need to learn to think for yourself and be proactive. That's enough for now. Pack up. After I get the information I need from the werewolf, we'll leave here. Seeing Chiki's pitiful look, Anduin felt a bit helpless. He needed to extract more information about the werewolf wizard from this captive. Such a dangerous individual must be dealt with thoroughly. A hem young man, one of the centaur elders called out, seeing that Anduin had barely acknowledged them. I know you don't like humans, but I need to use this place. If you don't want to see me, leave, Anduin said without turning around, still focused on the werewolf. No, young wizard, we mean you no harm. You saved the lives and freedom of our centaur tribe. We just want to express our gratitude, the elder centaur said respectfully, placing his right hand on his chest. He dared not show any disrespect, as the young man before him had just killed the werewolves that besieged them. Several other centaurs nodded in agreement. Oh? Anduin turned to look at the group of centaurs, adjusting the monocle in front of him. I accept your thanks, but I came here for these werewolves. I saved you for Hagrid's sake. Hagrid? You mean Hagrid from Hogwarts? A handsome young centaur stepped forward. He had striking blue eyes, platinum blonde hair, and a silver lower body with a ponytail, making him quite handsome for a centaur. Firenze, do you know the wizard your benefactor mentioned? The centaur elder asked, turning to Firenze. End of this chapter. Chapter 223, Gifts. That's right, but Hagrid doesn't seem to be a wizard. I've seen him several times while hunting in the territory close to Hogwarts and gradually became familiar with him. He's different from other wizards. I even shared my prey with him. Firenze's voice was clear and loud, but not harsh. He's my friend, the guard of the Forbidden Forest at Hogwarts, Anduin nodded. What Firenze said matched the information he had heard from Hagrid. It turns out that you still have such a connection. It seems that fate has not abandoned the Centaur tribe, and Venus is still taking care of us, the elder centaur said, placing his hands on his chest and saluting the sky. The other centaurs followed suit, showing much more reverence than they had when facing Anduin. Seeing this, Anduin couldn't help frowning. Why are these centaurs talking as if they were saved by fate? If I had known it, I would have waited for them to die before making a move, he thought. The movement of the stars is ever-changing, in the face of the vast and magnificent universe, we are as insignificant as ants. I advise you not to always count on those stars. Sometimes wise eyes and minds are more reliable than the sky. Anduin interrupted, a bit puzzled. You. Another young centaur next to the elder heard Anduin's disrespectful words and wanted to protest, but was immediately stopped by the elder. Ronan, there is great wisdom in the words of our benefactor. Do not be disrespectful. The elder shook his head at the young centaur, then looked at Anduin. You are right. Sometimes we fall into the myths brought about by astrology. Just like this crisis, we were almost unaware of it beforehand. The elder took a few steps forward and asked softly, Please tell us your name. I am the chief of this centaur tribe, Brand Varden. In this forest you call the Forbidden Forest. We regard the southern territory, the area close to Hogwarts, as our domain. From now on, you will be our guest and friend. Anduin Wilson, currently studying at Hogwarts. Nice to meet you, Anduin replied politely, 
recognizing the elder's wisdom and rationality. Nice to meet you, Anduin, Branvarden smiled, taking a horn from his body and handing it to Anduin. To thank you for your help, please accept this gift. This horn is made from the horns of Reem cattle. Blow it in the southern region, and all the centaurs who hear it will come to your aid immediately. Thank you, Anduin raised his eyebrows and accepted the horn contentedly, surprised by the gift. At this moment, the handsome Firenze stepped forward, took off the only intact longbow on his body, and handed it to Anduin. This is my side weapon. It is made of blackthorn wood and my tail hair. It is my treasure. It symbolizes my friendship and respect for you. Please accept it, Firenze said respectfully. Facing Firenze's solemnity, Anduin accepted the longbow with a serious expression. Then, the centaurs around him lined up, stepping forward one by one to present their treasured gifts to Anduin. Even Ronan, who had been somewhat disrespectful before, presented his most beloved fine steel dagger respectfully. After a while, Anduin received a horn, a longbow, a dagger, a spear, two bags of rare herbs, a necklace made of unicorn tail hair and animal teeth, and a piece of bezoar the size of a centaur's fist. Receiving these gifts, Anduin gained a deeper understanding of the centaurs. Although they were a bit stubborn, they were simple, natural, and more trustworthy compared to some scheming humans. After accepting the gift solemnly, the elder Branvarden told Anduin that he was welcome to seek their help whenever needed. Anduin seemed to have thought of something and asked Branvarden, Do you know anything about these werewolves and the leader of the werewolf wizard? How did he suddenly gather the werewolves together? Well, regarding these werewolves, I only know that they were previously active in the Northern Territory. According to information from our kin in the Northern Territory, their activity, IS, have been relatively scattered with no signs of gathering, Brandwaden explained, pointing in the direction where Anduin had appeared earlier. And I've never seen that werewolf leader, but I have some guesses about him. Oh, what are your guesses? Anduin inquired. Do you know the mysterious man? Brandwaden asked. You mean the Dark Lord? Anduin raised his eyebrows in surprise. Why was he being brought up again? Yes, before the mysterious man died, he sent an envoy to contact us, trying to recruit the centaurs to fight for him. Of course we refused, but this led to enmity with the mysterious man's forces. During that time, we had numerous skirmishes with the dark wizards. To avoid further conflict, the centaur tribes in the Forbidden Forest dispersed and settled in different areas. We were discussing reuniting some time ago, Brandwaden sighed. Anduin nodded, realizing the extent of the Dark Lord's influence. It seemed he wanted to bring even non-human races under his command. As far as I know, apart from targeting us, they have also tried to contact werewolves, giants, and even trolls. Of course, they failed. Trolls, with their limited intelligence, couldn't understand their intentions, Brandwaden explained. You mean that the werewolf wizard might have been sent by the mysterious man to summon the werewolves? Anduin suddenly realized. Yes, he probably succeeded, but with the mysterious man's death, and having gathered a bunch of werewolves under his command, he now has to find another way out, Brandwaden nodded. I see. Thank you for your clarification, Anduin thanked the elder. It was the Death Eaters again. These guys were really persistent, and Anduin believed that Brandwaden's guess was likely accurate. He couldn't let this werewolf leader go unchecked. After finishing their conversation, Brandwaden bid farewell to Anduin and led the centaurs away. The young centaurs, led by Firenze, nodded respectfully to Anduin before leaving. They understood the importance of expressing gratitude where it was due. After watching the centaurs leave, Anduin placed the gifts he had received into his newly made space ring and began planning his next move. End of this chapter. Chapter 224. Fenrir Greyback. Although the origins of these werewolves were roughly clarified, Anduin was still very concerned about the escaped werewolf leader. First of all, he had to find a way to identify the other party, locate him, and deal with him. He also didn't know if these werewolves had their own stronghold in the Forbidden Forest or if there were any others who had slipped through the net besides these ten werewolves. Thinking about it, Anduin raised his hand and sent out an electric arc, awakening the unconscious werewolf lying on the ground. Ah! Oh! The werewolf who regained consciousness let out an angry howl, 
But just as he opened his mouth, the spirit-binding snake bound to his mouth quickly tightened, suppressing all subsequent sounds into his throat. The silent werewolf struggled and tried to get up, but was immediately stepped on by Anduin. Now this werewolf was restrained by both the magic-forbidden handcuffs and the spirit-binding snake. After a while, he was so exhausted that he was out of breath, and in the end, he could only stare at Anduin fiercely, his eyes still shining with a crazed light. Can you understand human speech? Anduin asked condescendingly. As he spoke, he increased the pressure on his foot and controlled the spirit-binding snake to loosen a little. Huh! Human, die! The werewolf shouted frantically. He made a gesture to bite Anduin, but was quickly restrained by the tightened spirit snake. It seems you can't understand human words, Anduin shook his head. He then took out a large box full of various supplies from his interspatial ring and turned to look at Cheeky. There are tents and food in here. Let's camp here tonight, help set it up, make a bonfire, and prepare some food. The new space ring he made with Ulim steel had a huge internal storage space. In addition to storing a large number of field survival tools and daily necessities for himself, he had even moved in all the materials from the basement of number 2277 Diagon Alley. Now, the basement part of the warehouse had been transformed to a secret underground laboratory by him. Yes, master, Chiki replied eagerly. This was her first job after becoming Anduin's house elf, and she hurriedly set to work with enthusiasm. Chichi was quite skilled in housework magic. Her two little hands were proficient in double-line operation, one hand unfolding the tent cloth and the other hand controlling the combination of brackets. After instructing Chichi, Anduin turned his attention back to the werewolf. He raised the werewolf's head with a giant palm made of magic power and then looked into the werewolf's scarlet eyes, full of madness. He launched Legilimency. Compared to normal humans, werewolves have a very different spiritual world. Their protection against memory and spirit is much weaker than that of humans. Human wizards have an instinctive rejection and resistance to mind-invading magic, but werewolves are like a shopping mall with its doors open. You can look and touch at will, but the memories in their brains are full of disorder, primitiveness, and chaos. Although it is easy to invade, it is difficult to search for useful memories, making it a bigger challenge than with humans. But fortunately, werewolves have a good memory. Maybe this is why werewolves hold grudges so much and must take revenge. They keep a lot of long-term memories in their minds. Although the distribution is very scattered and chaotic, they are still there and can be accessed. Anduin spent nearly an hour on the werewolf's legilimency. By the time he was done, Chichi had not only set up the tent but had also cooked a pot of fragrant soup on the campfire in front of the tent. With a heavy thud, Anduin threw the werewolf down and twisted his stiff neck. After spending so long, he had finally found some useful information. From the werewolf's memory, he learned the general course of the matter. The werewolf wizard was... Fenrir Greyback had long been the leader of a werewolf community. However, in the eyes of Anduin, Fenrir was a werewolf extremist and terrorist. Fenrir was committed to biting and infecting as many people as possible. He would even adopt children he had infected, training them to become warriors. Moreover, Fenrir enjoyed intensifying the conflict between werewolves and wizards, leading his fellow werewolves to attack wizards, carry out terrorist activities, and teaching those infected with lycanthropy to hate humans and wizards. Anduin also discovered a troubling fact. Fenrir's activities were not confined to the UK, and his base of operations wasn't even in the country. Fenrir had connections with the Death Eaters. In the latter part of the war, he formed an alliance with the Dark Lord, traveling on the Death Eater's advice to gather werewolves scattered across various regions, including native werewolves and those infected with lycanthropy. Not long after Fenrir allied with the Death Eaters in England, the Dark Lord was defeated and the Death Eaters' activities went underground. Despite this, Fenrir continued to search for werewolf kin. Native werewolves were easy to control. Fenrir, with his shared identity, immense strength, and human cunning, managed to gather many native werewolves. The one captured by Anduin belonged to this group. However, many lycanthropy patients were unwilling to be controlled and manipulated by Fenrir. 
Many of them were victims, transformed into werewolves after being attacked and bitten. They harbored deep disgust and hatred for werewolves and even for their own identities. Therefore, most of them refused Fenrir's solicitations. In response, the cruel and dictatorial Fenrir launched a brutal purge against them. Living at the bottom of society, even the Ministry of Magic knew little about their plight. During this period, Fenrir led the native werewolves around, fighting those who refused to surrender. Many infected werewolves were forced into submission through violence, and those who resisted were brutally killed. Fenrir then transferred the submissive infected werewolves to the European mainland, handing them over to his companions for management. Meanwhile, he and the native werewolves stayed in the Forbidden Forest, smuggling magical creatures and non-human intelligent beings to raise funds. They had hunted many magical creatures before, including Thestrals, Measles, Mooncalves, Diracals, and Rune Spores. This time, their target was unicorns, but by accident, they discovered centaurs. Fenrir is currently imprisoning all these captured prey in a secret stronghold within the Forbidden Forest. End of this chapter. Chapter 225. Marching Uniforms. The stronghold was far from their current location, and several werewolves guarded it. Anduin estimated it would take at least two or three hours to reach it at full speed. If Fenrir reacted quickly enough, this time would be sufficient for them to evacuate. Moreover, Anduin was not in the best condition. Mental and physical exhaustion plagued him, making it impossible to sustain another major battle. He decided he needed to rest before pursuing them. After making his decision, Anduin glanced at the werewolf lying on the ground. Following his principle of not wasting resources, he took out various materials and utensils, collecting blood, hair, and saliva from the werewolf. Then, with a sharp, shadowless blade, he killed the creature. It was better not to keep such dangerous beings alive. Cheeky, who had been watching Anduin perform these strange tasks on the werewolf, was visibly shaken. She couldn't help but feel panicked. Her new master did not seem to be a kind person. After tidying up, Anduin approached Cheeky. Noticing that the elf was stiff and trembling, he gave her a puzzled look. What's the matter, are you cold? No, Cheeky is not cold, master. Please drink the soup, Cheeky replied, her voice trembling. She quickly filled a bowl of soup, but her shaking hands caused some to spill. I'm sorry, master. I'm sorry. Cheeky was wrong. She said nervously, rubbing her hands on the rag she wore, unsure of how to punish herself due to Anduin's previous orders. Don't be nervous, Cheeky. I'll do it myself. And by the way, you don't need to apologize to me in the future. You don't owe anyone an apology, understand? Anduin said, filling a bowl of thick soup. He took a sip and looked at Cheeky with some surprise. The soup was well made. It would be better if the mushrooms were cooked for another two minutes, but the heat is well controlled, Anduin commented, taking another sip and nodding in approval. I'm sorry, master. I'll pay more attention next time. Cheeky said, misinterpreting his comment as criticism. She lowered her head nervously, tears welling up in her eyes. Seeing her reaction, Anduin shook his head helplessly. This elf was too sensitive, always on edge. Don't just stand there. You can eat some too, he motioned to Cheeky. No, Cheeky is not hungry. Chichi is not worthy to eat with the master, she replied, shaking her head in panic. She did not dare to do something so presumptuous. Chichi, Anduin said seriously, there is nothing unworthy about you. You are a free individual. No matter how you were taught before, with me, you don't need to be so formal. Freedom? The former owner told Chichi that Chichi is a slave and is not worthy. She began. If you say such things again, I will get angry. I don't care how you perceive yourself. But I don't like people talking in a low voice in front of me. So, even if you are pretending, you have to straighten your back and speak clearly and forcefully. Anduin said, looking at Chi-Chi with some annoyance. It seemed this elf needed proper training to understand how to stand and sit properly. Yes, master, Chi-Chi responded, quickly straightening her back and looking Anduin in the eye. This was very difficult for her, as she had to overcome the humility and fear ingrained in her heart. Anduin's expression softened. It seemed that for someone who only knew how to obey orders, military-style training was necessary. All right, listen to my command. Now, eat and sleep. Under Anduin's strict orders, Chiki ate a full meal and slept on a warm bed with a quilt and mattress for the first time in her life. 
Covering herself with a quilt felt like a dream. In Cheeky's eyes, Anduin's image began to change. A wonderful change. The new owner was cruel to the werewolves, but why was he so kind to a humble elf like her? Puzzled, Chichi gradually fell into dreamland. When she woke up again, it was not yet dawn. Her master Anduin stood in front of her in full armor. Next to her bed was a brand new set of marching uniforms, including shoes. Master, what is this? Iqui quickly got up, looking at him in confusion. Hurry up and put on your clothes. I use the shrinking curse on them. They will make you less visible in the forest. We need to find those remaining werewolves before dawn, Anduin said forcefully. Master, don't you want cheeky? When a master gives us clothes, we become free. But free house elves are spurned elves, and cheeky finally found a new master. Cheeky burst into tears, feeling it was a shame to be free. I'll say this one last time. Don't cry. You are free. If you want to work with me, then you have to obey my orders. I will pay you according to your work. If you continue to dawdle, then stay and cry in the forbidden forest by yourself, Anduin commanded firmly. He had already figured out how to communicate with house elves. These ingrained habits could only be changed slowly over time. The most urgent task now was to launch a sneak attack on the werewolf stronghold before dawn. Hearing Anduin's words, Chiki quickly stopped crying and frantically picked up the suit. She didn't want to be left alone in the woods. Her reaction was due to her instinctive humility and fear of causing trouble. After putting on the camouflage combat uniform, Chiki appeared more capable. Although she was initially resistant to the suit, she couldn't hide her admiration as she adjusted her appearance and touched the fabric from time to time. Anduin didn't care about Chiki's conflicted behavior. He quickly packed up the camping equipment, and when everything was ready, he picked up Chiki, took out a broomstick, and flew towards the known stronghold. It was only three or four o'clock in the morning, still some time before dawn. This was the time when all creatures in the Forbidden Forest rested. Anduin planned to use this time to wipe out the werewolves. If Fenrir had returned to the stronghold and moved immediately, this would also be their rest time, allowing them to catch up along the footsteps of the stronghold. End of this chapter. Chapter 226, Authentic, because they knew the specific location in advance, there was no need to follow the footprints on the ground as before. Taking a broomstick saved a lot of energy. Anduin and Chichi flew in the air for about two hours. Although the Forbidden Forest was still very dark at this time, there were some faint morning lights. He estimated that they were not far from the stronghold, so he slowly descended on the broomstick, ready to approach quietly. However, since a battle might start at any time, it was inconvenient to take Chichi with him. Chichi, wait for me here. If you encounter danger, activate this amulet and then apparate away, Anduin whispered, handing Chichi a communication amulet. Yes, master, Chichi replied softly, taking the talisman carefully. After arranging for Chichi, Anduin activated the shimmering cloak again and disappeared into the air instantly. According to the memory picture in the werewolf's mind, Anduin only spent ten minutes finding the target location. It was a stone hill in a dense forest, surrounded by a large amount of vegetation, and the stone hill was covered with creepers and other vine-like plants. Except for this small stone hill, which was more than ten meters high, the surrounding area was full of tall and short trees and shrubs, nothing special at all, and no trace of biological activity. But he knew that the werewolf's secret stronghold was under this rocky hill. Fenrir had dug an underground passage from here, leading to a nearby natural cave. The exit of the tunnel was built beside the small rocky mountain. However, he couldn't just break into the tunnel. Judging from the information obtained from the werewolf's memory, a native werewolf would be guarding the entrance of the tunnel. Anduin approached cautiously, and after careful exploration, he finally found the entrance of the tunnel. It was a huge, disc-shaped boulder covered with moss, at least two meters in radius. He tapped on the boulder with a unique frequency, while holding his wand, ready to cast a spell. He didn't know whether Fenrir had returned to the stronghold. If he had, there might be deviations in the layout below, but he could only use the original code to open the door. After knocking on the boulder, Anduin waited for a while. Finally, there was a rustling sound from the bottom of the tunnel, as if his knocking had woken up the tunnel guards. 
After a while, the boulder slowly moved to one side. An old werewolf with mottled hair slowly pushed the stone cover away, yawning and rubbing his eyes irritably, as if complaining that his companion had disturbed his sleep. Then he heard a whoosh, and the next second he felt his body lighten. His eyes gradually floated up uncontrollably until his lone wolf head fell to the ground. The bone-piercing pain made him realize there were enemies. The old werewolf, who had just reacted, wanted to shout out, but he had no strength left, and his consciousness gradually withdrew from his body. In his dying moments, he saw only a human who suddenly appeared in front of him, tearing his bloody remnant and throwing it out, then quickly jumping into the tunnel. After quickly killing the gatekeeper werewolf with a spell, Anduin threw the body out and used a magic spell to expel the blood and air from the entrance of the passage. These werewolves had very good noses, and the blood had to be cleaned up quickly. After entering the tunnel, Anduin slowly began to examine the environment. The whole tunnel was very wide, with a height and width of more than three meters. This was likely because the werewolves needed to hunt large magical creatures, and a smaller tunnel would not be conducive to transportation. At the same time, there was no light in the tunnel. It was extremely dark and filled with an unpleasant sour smell. The ground and walls were damp and covered in moss, making the air thick and musty. Covered with stains and hairs, Anduin cast a head-soaking spell on himself, which made him feel more comfortable. After closing the passageway, he restarted his shimmering cloak and explored ahead without using any lighting, relying solely on the detection effect of the echo spell. Judging from the reaction of the gatekeeper werewolf earlier, Fenrir had not returned to the stronghold. This was both good and bad news for Anduin. The good news was that the werewolves in this stronghold were likely in a defenseless state, which was beneficial to his actions. The bad news was that he wouldn't be able to deal with the werewolf leader, leaving a hidden danger unresolved. However, Anduin didn't dwell on it. His immediate task was to eliminate this stronghold quickly to avoid future troubles. After exploring silently for a certain distance, a faint light flickered ahead. As he approached, a large cave with a height of seven or eight people appeared before him. The entrance of the passage was in the center of the cave, requiring a few steps down to enter. As far as he could see, there were many large and small metal cages on both sides of the cave, each containing various magical creatures. At this time, they were all lying on the ground, immersed in sleep. Several large empty cages seemed to be prepared for new prey. The cave was divided into three floors, embedded layer by layer. On the right side, a stone staircase led to each floor, with iron doors installed, suggesting these were used as prison cells. The rest of the stone caves were wide open, and Anduin could hear some grunting from the adjacent stone rooms, indicating that the werewolves inside were sleeping soundly. Using the concealment provided by the shimmering cloak and phase shoes, Anduin began to investigate the stone chambers layer by layer. Each chamber had one or two floors covered with straw and fur, and the interiors were filthy, showing that these werewolves didn't pay much attention to hygiene. He also found a particularly spacious stone cave with special beds and various furniture, which seemed to be Fenrir's room. With the help of the Echo Spell, Anduin discovered that only four native werewolves remained in the entire cave, and most of the stone rooms were empty. It appeared that these rooms belonged to the team of werewolves he had encountered the previous night. Having gathered enough information, Anduin began his assassination operation. This could hardly be called an assassination, it was more of a massacre. He quietly entered a stone room and aimed at the sleeping werewolf's head. After a flash of sharpness, he restarted the shimmering cloak, moved to the next stone room, and repeated the process. End of this chapter. Chapter 227, The Silver Spear. Anduin moved swiftly and ruthlessly. Within less than a minute, he had navigated through the stone chambers, leaving the four werewolves who had stayed behind lifeless before they could even react. After dealing with them, he began a meticulous search of each stone room, hoping to find something of value. However, Anduin soon realized that this group of native werewolves were impoverished. They had no savings, only some carrion bitten off from unknown creatures. 
it was only in Fenrir's bedroom that he found anything of interest. Despite being a lycanthropy wizard, Fenrir did not seem to have good hygienic habits. The clothes and floor were stained with blood. Enduring the discomfort, Anduin searched carefully and found a leather money bag and two pieces of parchment. Inside the money bag, there were properties worth more than 200 gold galleons, mostly silver sickles and copper nuts. It seemed that although Fenrir was the leader of the werewolves, his economic conditions were not very good. The two pieces of parchment were randomly spread out on the desk. One was a list of goods filled with words and numbers, detailing the prices of various magical creatures and intelligent races. An adult unicorn can be sold for a thousand galleons, and a juvenile unicorn is worth fifteen hundred galleons. A healthy coat is six hundred galleons? This is just the price of smuggling. No wonder these gangs are willing to risk their lives. The profit is enormous, Anduin thought as he browsed through the contents of the parchment. The figures recorded were shocking. Even Anduin didn't expect the dark side of the wizarding world to be filled with so many illegal trades of magical creatures. The parchment recorded not only British local creatures, but also many foreign magical creatures, including intelligent creatures like Vila, mermaids, and even werewolves themselves. This was clearly a uniform supply list provided by a specialized organization. Anduin began to check the parchment for relevant records and found a small inscription on the corner of the list. It was engraved with a seal depicting a simple spear, and the name was straightforward. Silver Spear. Silver Spear? Anduin was taken aback, not because the name was simple or mysterious, but because he had seen information about this organization before. He once read in a book about the history of dueling that mentioned the Silver Spear, a notorious secret dueling club that originated in the 18th century. The condition for admission was to only accept holders of aspen wood wands. Initially, they were just a small circle of enthusiasts, similar to an aspen wand club. Aspen wood, with its beautiful grain, stylish appearance like ivory, and excellent strength, earned the name Silver Spear. However, because most Aspen Wood wand holders were strong-willed and powerful wizards, the club evolved into a dueling club. The wizards from this club were known for their combativeness, frequently challenging others to duels and often seriously injuring or even killing their opponents. They would boast about their victories, making the name Silver Spear infamous in that era. The records were not very detailed about the club's later years. It seemed that at some point, a conflict broke out within the club, resulting in many deaths. Since then, the name Silver Spear had disappeared from history and was hardly ever mentioned again. Isn't this club supposed to be defunct? Why has it reappeared, and why is it linked to a smuggling organization? Anduin wondered. He folded the parchment and put it away, pondering the implications of this discovery. Anduin picked up another piece of parchment. This one had many names recorded on it, some marked with red ink, others with red crosses, check marks, or left blank. Could this be a list of lycanthropy patients? Anduin wondered aloud. The crossed out names might represent those who have been killed, the check marks could indicate those who have surrendered, and the unmarked ones are likely patients who haven't been found or dealt with, yet. As he scanned the list, a familiar name caught his eye. Remus John Lupin. Isn't this James's good friend? He's a werewolf? Anduin was puzzled. But he graduated from Hogwarts. If he were a werewolf, someone would have noticed. Could he have been infected after graduation? Anduin stared at the name, feeling uncertain. Although it was possible that the names overlapped, the wizarding world wasn't large, and the probability of two people having the same name was low. It seemed that Lupin had his own secrets. However, Anduin decided it wasn't his concern. Since Lupin hadn't caused any trouble for years, Anduin chose to keep the list for future reference. It might come in handy if he encountered a werewolf elsewhere. At that moment, a rustling sound came from outside the stone room. The imprisoned magical creatures seemed to have smelled fresh blood or were waking up, making moaning and chirping noises. Oh, right, the magical creatures. Anduin slapped his forehead, realizing he had been so preoccupied with the werewolves that he had forgotten about them. He hurried out of the stone room to check on their condition. The cave was still pitch black with no light and stuffy air. 
only the tunnel provided some ventilation. Fortunately, several oil lamps hung on the surrounding rock walls. Anduin quickly lit them, and the dim light barely illuminated the interior. Holding a copper oil lamp, Anduin inspected the iron cages carefully. More than ten magical creatures were imprisoned in the cave. In one large iron cage, two moon calves, which looked like small alpacas, stared at him with wide, crystal-like eyes. They appeared sluggish and weak, their bodies thin from neglect. In the adjacent large iron cage was a young chilin, also skinny and bony, its condition equally poor. Anduin sighed, realizing the creatures had not been well cared for. He knew he had to do something to help them. Chapter 228, Husky, Seeking Monthly Ticket Recommendation Next to the two large iron cages was a smaller metal cage. Inside it was a creature that looked like an ordinary cat, except it had a lion-like tail, a frog-like head with horns, bright red eyes, tusks, and a body resembling a large dog. This was a maulizi. There were also two fire crabs with gems on their backs, three hedgehog-like creatures, two earth minks that were much larger than ordinary minks, and a mott with tentacles on its back. Additionally, a bird snake was locked in a large transparent glass jar. This creature could expand and contract at will, and if released, it could fill the entire cave in an instant. All these magical creatures shared a common feature. They were very listless, covered with stains and clay, as if they had been starved for several days. They looked very pitiful. Anduin then moved to the inner caves, which had been dug out and fitted with metal doors. There were four such cells in the cave. One of them was empty, with a large internal space and a high ceiling. In the second cell, Anduin found a horned camel, a huge creature with a raised back, two very sharp golden horns on its head, and greasy tentacles growing from its mouth. It, too, was lying on the ground, looking very lethargic. It glanced at Anduin briefly before closing its eyes again. When Anduin reached the third stone room, a piercing roar erupted from inside, accompanied by the sound of an iron chain being tightened. He took a closer look with the oil lamp and found a manticore locked inside. It had the shape of a lion, but with a long tail ending in a hook, thick limbs, and sharp, long claws. The manticore wore a thick metal ring around its neck, with four iron chains connecting it to the stone wall behind it. There were several bloodstains on its body, indicating it had been either whipped or scratched by werewolves. Upon entering the fourth cell, Anduin was taken aback by what he saw. A husky? he muttered in surprise. Inside the cell lay a wolfhound covered in scars, resembling a Siberian husky from the Muggle world. It had scratches and whip marks all over its body, with many wounds still bleeding. Despite its severe injuries, its eyes were sharp and energetic, and it looked at Anduin coldly. How can there be an ordinary pet dog here? And the tail doesn't look like a swallowtail dog, Anduin wondered aloud. It was unimaginable for a dog to appear in this cave full of magical creatures. I'm not a dog, I'm a wolf, you idiot. A slightly weak but clear young voice came from the mouth of the husky, startling Anduin. He took a closer look to confirm that he wasn't hallucinating. What are you looking at? Are you the merchant brought by those werewolves to pick up the goods? Those guys will wait until you pay the money and then bite you to the bone, the husky said sarcastically, trying to cheer up. Are you a werewolf or an animagus? Anduin asked curiously after confirming that the husky was indeed speaking. What's it to you? Are you going to buy me? I promise I'll tear your throat apart once I'm out. Heh! Cough! The husky replied, but it was obvious that it was too injured to laugh without coughing. You'd better take it easy. You don't seem to have a good relationship with werewolves. Let me tell you some good news. Those werewolves are dead. What is your relationship with them? Anduin asked, noticing the husky's look of hatred whenever werewolves were mentioned. Those. Werewolves are dead? Ha ha ha! If you say they're dead, they're dead? Who do you think you are? The sarcasm in the husky's words grew sharper, and the hatred in his eyes remained undiminished. Seeing that the husky didn't believe him, Anduin turned around and left for a moment. When he returned, he threw a werewolf head in front of the cage door with a resounding bang. The werewolf's head still bore traces of surprise and confusion. The husky stared, dumbfounded, at the undeniable evidence Anduin had presented. 
With its bruised body, it rushed to the cage, door and bit the werewolf's head fiercely through the gaps in the iron net, chewing it up and swallowing it raw. Witnessing this, Anduin couldn't help but curl his lips in disgust. This is too careless about personal hygiene, he thought. Such a dirty wolf head, I wouldn't even dare to touch it. Kicking the wolf's head away, Anduin squatted down again, looking at the husky with a cold expression. Now, can you answer my question? You really killed those werewolves? You weren't lying to me? The husky still hadn't recovered from his excitement, but he looked at Anduin eagerly. Anduin sighed helplessly. It seemed that the husky wouldn't speak honestly unless he was told everything clearly. I'm not sure if I got all of them. Anyway, I killed four in this cave, one in the tunnel at the entrance, and ten last night. There was also a werewolf wizard who escaped. His name seemed to be Fenrir. So in total, I killed fifteen werewolves. Are you satisfied now? When the husky heard Anduin recount the werewolf kills as if he were talking about eating a few eggs, his eyes widened and his mouth fell open. That's right, one of what you said is right. It's them, those bastards. The husky's tone changed instantly after the shock, and he couldn't help but burst into tears, lying on the ground and covering his face. It seemed that the entanglement between this husky and the werewolves ran deep. Anduin felt a pang of emotion seeing the husky's intense reaction. Now, can you answer my question? Anduin asked again after the husky had calmed down a little. Ask away. You are my benefactor now. I will tell you everything I know, the husky said, coughing intermittently. It seemed that the husky had exhausted a lot of energy in his emotional turmoil. Seeing this, Anduin quickly took out a bottle of nourishing potion, handed it over, and used his magic to help the husky drink it. End of this chapter. Chapter 2 and 29. Life Experience. Although this husky appeared harmless and seemed to harbor a grudge against werewolves, it was not wise to release it without understanding its background. If it was also a werewolf, it could be infected with the dangerous lycanthropy virus. After the husky drank the potion, it finally breathed a sigh of relief, and its physical strength recovered significantly. All right, let's have a proper conversation now. Tell me who you are and why you can talk, Anduin said, seeing that the husky had recovered. Benefactor, my name is Hog, and I'm 14 years old, the husky, who looked like a typical dog, replied with a sigh. I'm neither a werewolf nor an animagus, nor even an ordinary wolf. My parents were both werewolves who were bitten and suffered from lycanthropy. Anduin was shocked by Hog's words. Your parents gave birth to you during the full moon? That's right, they were united during the full moon, and then I was born, Hog nodded. No wonder, Anduin thought. This creature looked very different from a werewolf and didn't resemble a magical creature, yet it could talk. He had read about such situations in some books. Werewolves are magical creatures with a strong infectious ability. If humans are bitten, they become infected with lycanthropy and involuntarily transform into werewolves during the full moon. They are also contagious at this time. However, if two lycanthropic werewolves mate in wolf form during a full moon, they produce offspring that do not show signs of lycanthropy but are actual wolf pups with intelligence close to humans. Originally, Anduin thought it was a legend, but he didn't expect it to be true. Hogg continued to share his life story. Although my parents were wizards, they did not abandon us after we were born. They took good care of us. However, some of my siblings died while growing up, and eventually, it was just me and my other brother. During my upbringing, my parents, my brother, and I lived in remote forests far from humans. Occasionally, they would take me to human villages to see the wizarding society, so I am not entirely unfamiliar with humans and wizards. Because I am a descendant of wizards, although I don't have a human form, I still possess enough wisdom and magic power. When my parents discovered this, they were very happy and began to teach us how to speak. It was difficult at first because our vocal structure is very different from that of humans, but soon we learned to use magic to change our vocalizations. I am more talented than my brother in this regard, which is why I can speak. So that's the case. How did you fall into the hands of these werewolves? Anduin asked, his curiosity piqued. It's all because of that werewolf wizard. Hog's eyes filled with hatred. Although we lived far from wizard society, we were in harmony until one day, 
that werewolf wizard led a group of werewolves to find us. At first, he wanted my parents to submit to him and help him launch a war against wizards. My parents refused and chose to leave, but unexpectedly, they attacked us when we were not paying attention. Poisonous hands, Hogg began, his eyes welling up with tears and his voice breaking. They launched a surprise attack in the middle of the night. Although we fought hard, we were outnumbered. My parents and elder brother, they were gone. These inhuman monsters actually ate them alive. I was the only one left because a wizard werewolf wanted to keep me and sell me for a good price. Hogg couldn't hold back any longer and burst into tears again. Hearing this, Anduin fell silent. These werewolves truly deserved to die. At the same time, he thought about how most lycanthropy patients were a group of unfortunate souls. They were not accepted by wizarding society and had to face brutal persecution from their own kind. After Hogg cried for a while, he finally calmed down. Anduin handed him another bottle of tonic and took out a fresh potion, using magic to heal his injuries. By the way, you mentioned earlier that a merchant came to pick up the goods. What did you mean by that? Anduin asked Hogg after treating his wound. Those werewolves go out every day searching for traces of magical creatures. Sometimes they bring in cloaked figures who buy these magical animals as if they were picking goods. But those werewolves are very cruel. If the merchant is alone or has no influence, they kill the person who came to trade and dismember the body, Hogg explained, now much more energetic after Anduin's treatment and the potion. So, these werewolves were not just smuggling magical creatures out of the country, they were also conducting local transactions. Anduin thought of the black market merchant whose body was dismembered in the Forbidden Forest. Doing business with werewolves truly required risking one's life. Anduin then began to consider what to do with Hogg. Hogg, I need to ask you a question, and I need you to answer honestly, Anduin said solemnly. Ask, my benefactor, Hogg replied. I know that children born to infected werewolves in human form do not show signs of lycanthropy. But what about you? If you bite someone, will they be infected with lycanthropy? Anduin asked, secretly activating legilimency to judge the sincerity of Hogg's words. How he would deal with Hogg next depended on his answer. My parents checked me. There is no virus in my saliva that can infect people. I do not react when the moon is full. When I was young and not sensible, I accidentally bit someone while with my mother, but they showed no signs of infection, Hogg replied, looking at Anduin with clear, sincere eyes. End of this chapter. Chapter 230 Professionals Anduin couldn't help but nod in agreement. Judging from the information obtained through legilimency, Hogg was telling the truth. However, to be absolutely certain, Anduin took out a test tube, collected some of Hogg's saliva, and carefully stored it. If Hogg did not carry the lycanthropy virus, Anduin wouldn't mind taking him in. Hogg's life had been quite miserable, and Anduin believed that Hagrid would not mind Hogg's identity. With a plan forming in his mind, Anduin pondered what to do with the magical animals now. Would the werewolf wizard Fenrir return to this stronghold? It was impossible to release these magical animals directly into the Forbidden Forest. Their current physical condition made survival unlikely, and many of them might prey on each other. For instance, the divine horned animal was a natural enemy of the moon-crazy beast. This stronghold needed to be monitored to catch Fenrir if he returned. Professional matters required professional handling to ensure peace of mind, but who should be entrusted with this task? Anduin's first thought was to notify the Ministry of Magic. Moody had his summons amulet, making it convenient to call him over. However, considering Hogg's situation, the Department of Magical Creatures might not handle it well. It seemed they would have to rely on their own people. First, Anduin would return to Hogwarts to find Hagrid to help with these creatures, and then hand over the monitoring to the Ministry of Magic. After making up his mind, Anduin turned to Hogg. Wait here for a while. I'll bring someone over to give you professional treatment. If Fenrir returns, use this amulet to activate the spell and I'll come to support you. Anduin handed Hogg a messenger amulet, fed him some dried meat to fill his stomach, and then walked out of the underground cave. Outside, Anduin gathered the corpse of the werewolf lying at the entrance, hid it, Cheeky waiting in the woods. Seeing Anduin reappear, Cheeky's eyes lit up. 
She was about to greet him, but remembered his instruction to stay quiet, so she held her mouth and looked at him expectantly. Cheeky, I need you to do me a favor. Come with me first, Anduin said, picking up Cheeky and taking her to a tree near the tunnel. He then took off his sweater and put a light cloak on her. Chichi, see that big rock over there? I need you to watch it for me. If you see the werewolf wizard, quickly activate the amulet I gave you. If there's any trouble, activate the shimmer cloak. It will help you hide. Ensure your safety and apparate away if you encounter danger, Anduin instructed carefully. Don't worry, master. Leave it to me, Chiki replied confidently. Although she had only been with Anduin for a day, his influence had made her more self-assured. After arranging Chiki's task, Anduin returned to the edge of the Forbidden Forest using apparition. When he got close, he was affected by Hogwarts's magic and could not apparate directly. It was early morning, and the rising sun cast a fog over the grounds of Hogwarts. Anduin landed in front of Hagrid's hut on his broomstick. Hagrid, are you awake? Anduin called out, banging on the door. After a while, Hagrid emerged in his pink one-piece pajamas, rubbing his sleepy eyes. What's the matter, Anduin? Did you investigate those magical animals all night? I was worried about you and didn't dare leave the amulet you gave me, Hagrid grumbled. Seeing Hagrid's concern, Anduin quickly explained what had happened the previous night, mentioning that more than a dozen magical creatures were being imprisoned. Anduin was in urgent need of treatment and care. What? You mean you ran into werewolf smugglers and started a war with them? My god, this is too dangerous. Why didn't you inform us so that we could help? Hagrid exclaimed, his concern evident. Despite hearing about the abuse of many cute animals, his primary worry was for Anduin's safety. I had a sense of proportion. Don't you see that I'm unscathed now? The situation was critical at the time. If there had been any Dietzma, L.A., those centaurs would have been murdered. These werewolves act very cruelly. I couldn't keep my composure then. The key now is to settle those magical animals, Anduin explained, though he didn't mention that he had been preoccupied with experimenting with new spells. Yes, 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 Hagrid said, visibly relieved that Anduin was unharmed. However, he became anxious upon hearing that many magical creatures were still in dire straits. But there are so many magical animals that the two of us can't handle alone. We need to find one or two helpers. I agree. We also need to check the little wolf with wisdom to confirm whether it has the wolf-like virus. Otherwise, I dare not let him out. The risk is too great, Anduin added. By the way, have you heard of Hog's situation? I've read about the situation of a full moon werewolf giving birth to wolf cubs, but there are only two clear records, and the descriptions are quite simple, Anduin said, still cautious about Hog. He wanted confirmation from a real expert on magical beasts. I've only heard about it, but I've never seen an example, Hagrid replied, then suddenly slapped his head. Let's go to Professor Kettleburn. He has more experience than me. We can ask him for help. Professor Kettleburn? He only has one leg left, and he's quite old. Is it suitable? Anduin felt a bit sorry for the professor of magical animals, although he knew Kettleburn's love for magical creatures was no less than Hagrid's. Let's ask about that wolf first. If he's inconvenient, I'll go to Headmaster Dumbledore. Hagrid responded quickly when it came to dealing with magical animals. Anduin nodded and accompanied Hagrid to find Professor Kettleburn, who was teasing his fire snake when they arrived. The professor had a good relationship with Hagrid and was no stranger to Anduin. Since Anduin became a student of the Magical Beasts class, he often asked Kettleburn to take care of large creatures that were inconvenient for him to handle. Anduin had no objection to this, as these so-called large creatures were basically his reserve rations, and raising them himself ensured they grew fatter. End of this chapter. Chapter 231 Professor Kettleburn What? You mean there are a bunch of poor little creatures waiting to be rescued? Damn, those smugglers have no idea how to take care of magical animals. Every year, it seems like more of these poor creatures die in smuggling. Take me to them. I want to see them in person. Professor Kettleburn, whose hair was already graying, was furious after hearing Anduin's narration. He immediately wanted to follow. We'd better bring them back here. Your body can't handle such a trip, Anduin said helplessly looking at the old professor with a prosthetic leg and a cane. I'm not too old to move, 
Stop talking nonsense and lead the way. It's a good thing you didn't let them out rashly. Otherwise, the sudden change in environment could kill them, Kettleburn said, controlling his prosthesis with magic and moving towards Anduin with surprising agility. This. Anduin looked at the very stubborn old professor. After a wordless exchange of glances with Hagrid, he could only reluctantly agree. Well, I'll ride my flying motorcycle and take the professor with me. Anduin, you lead the way on your broomstick, Hagrid suggested, patting his thigh. Well, that's fine, Anduin nodded helplessly, seeing that Hagrid didn't object. Then the three set off as planned. Hagrid rolled out the motorcycle sent by Sirius, carrying the wrinkled but energetic Professor Kettleburn, and followed Anduin closely to the underground cave. By the way, Professor, you haven't answered the question we asked you before, about the full moon wolf cub, Anduin reminded. Kettleburn had been too excited earlier and had hurriedly dragged Anduin away without addressing the question. At this time, Professor Kettleburn was sitting hunched in the motorcycle with a pair of windproof glasses on his eyes. After hearing Anduin's question, he thought for a while and then looked at him. According to research, the offspring of a werewolf with lycanthropy, whether in human form or wolf form, will indeed not carry the lycanthropy virus. But just in case, I will do a virus test on the spot later. By the way, that little wolf named Hugo is really special because it can talk, Kettleburn explained, his excitement growing more intense as he couldn't wait to see the creatures. After hearing the professor's explanation, Anduin nodded, slightly relieved. He then mobilized his magic power, boosted the flying broom under him, and rushed out at high speed. His broom was of average quality and actually slower than a flying motorcycle. To speed up, he had to boost himself. The three of them flew straight along the direct route in the air, maintaining extreme speed. It didn't take much time, just over an hour, to reach the boulder. After landing, Anduin immediately found Chiki, who was using the shimmering cloak to hide herself. She seemed to be faithfully completing her task. Chichi, seeing her master, hurriedly ran forward. Master, Chiki has been watching the big rock. No one has approached. Okay, thank you for your hard work, Chiki. Take a rest first, and accompany us into the cave later. We may need your help, Anduin said, taking the robe and nodding in praise. Yes, master, Chiki promises to complete the task. Chiki stood upright, showing less submissiveness than before, though she still had an awkward expression. Anduin, why didn't you see me all night? You suddenly have an extra house elf, Hagrid said, rubbing his swollen belly. He and Professor Kettleburn had eaten something casually while riding the motorcycle, and it was making him a bit gassy. Chichi was picked up by me when I was tracking those werewolves. Her former owner was brutally killed by werewolves. Anduin explained briefly. These werewolves are full of killing and have no reason. By the way, hurry up and take us to see the creatures, Hagrid urged. Those little guys who are locked up, some children will get sick after staying in a claustrophobic space for too long, Kettleburn said, his voice filled with concern. He had already started referring to the magical animals as children and was visibly anxious. Anduin didn't waste any time. He quickly pushed the flat stone aside and used a levitation spell to help Professor Kettleburn into the tunnel. They proceeded inside together. Fortunately, the tunnel was built high enough though Hagrid still had to lower his head to avoid hitting it. Compared to the early morning hours, the imprisoned magical creatures in the cave were now awake. Their hunger and discomfort caused them to let out painful whimpers, which echoed throughout the cave. Oh my god, Professor Kettleburn exclaimed, his footsteps quickening as he heard the wailing of the magical animals. When he saw their miserable conditions, he was even more horrified. Look at these poor creatures. What did those damned werewolves do to them? Hagrid, too, was deeply moved. His eyes softened, especially when he saw a manticore covered in scars. Oh, you poor thing, he murmured, his eyes lighting up with a tender affection. If Anduin hadn't stopped him, he might have opened the iron gate and released the creature right then and there. Benefactor, you're back, a voice called out. It was Hog, who was visibly excited to see Anduin. He hurried over to greet him. In Hogg's eyes, the young wizard had avenged him in a way, but he was still uncertain about his own fate. This left him both excited and apprehensive. Anduin noticed that Hogg was in good spirits, staring at him with wide eyes, 
much like an eager dog eyeing a new toy. The thought was a bit unsettling. Professor, Anduin called, tilting his head towards Kettleburn and gesturing to Hogg. This is the little moon wolf I mentioned to you before. Kettleburn, reminded by Anduin, turned his attention to Hogg. He approached with a caring expression, as if he were talking to a child. After learning about Hogg's life and situation, Kettleburn took out a bottle filled with a blue liquid. He collected some of Hogg's saliva, poured it into the reagent, and performed a series of intricate operations. Finally, he turned to Anduin. He does not have the lycanthropy virus, so he is safe, Kettleburn confirmed. End of this chapter. Chapter 232, Arrangements After hearing the affirmative answer, both Anduin and Hogg were relieved. In that case, let me release Hogg first. By the way, because of his special status, I think we should keep this from the Ministry of Magic. I don't really want to hand him over to them, Anduin said, discussing the matter with Kettleburn with some hesitation. For such a big issue, it's impossible to hide it from the Ministry of Magic entirely, and we still need their help to capture the escaped werewolf wizard. It must not be handed over to the Ministry of Magic, Kettleburn decided firmly. He has always distrusted those guys. What will happen is not just about Hog. All the magical animals here will be sent back to Hogwarts for unified care. They will be responsible for catching fugitives, and we won't have to worry about other things. I will keep the matter about Hog a secret. He can live in our hut. If the Ministry of Magic finds out, it will definitely spread, and nothing good will come of it. Hagrid also firmly expressed his position. It seemed that Hog's life experience had moved this big-hearted man. Seeing that both of them had unified thoughts, Anduin nodded and then released Hog from the prison cell. Hog, now free again, had mixed feelings. He had heard all the conversations between Anduin and the others, and seeing that there were still people willing to care about him, he felt warmth in his heart. On the other hand, Cheeky looked at Hog curiously from time to time. This dog looked so big, but also very cute. How could someone abuse it? Okay, that's all for the discussion about Hog. From now on, the three of us will be responsible for taking care of him. To the outside world, we will say that he is an ordinary hound. Hog should try to talk as little as possible in front of outsiders, Kettleburn said, blinking at Hog. Then he looked at the other two again. The next focus is on these magical animals that are not in good condition. Listen to my arrangement. These two manticores and horned camels are very aggressive. Apart from being a little hungry, they only have some trauma. I will feed them some sleeping pills in a while, and they can be transferred after they fall asleep. Then they will be placed in the fourth park. Hagrid, you will take care of them. Others like bird snakes, thorns, sables, mothra rats, and cats and raccoons are all malnourished, and the ventilation in this cave is extremely poor. They are more or less infected with pneumonia. I will give them some medicine first, and then transport them back to Hogwarts together with their cages. They need to be raised for a while before they can be released. Otherwise, they will easily injure themselves. And the two moon calves are in the worst condition. Not only are they malnourished, but their skin is also festering. It can be seen that they are infected with boils and pustules. They need to be isolated and treated uniformly. They are photophobic and in poor health so they can't see the sun. We have to cover the cage with a black cloth before transferring them, Kettleburn said, looking at the two moon calves with a distressed expression. Their eyes were drooping with no energy. This Thestral is fine and can be returned to the Thestral group after being brought back. Although I don't know if it belongs to the same family as those on the outskirts of the Forbidden Forest, the Thestral group is still very friendly to wandering fellows. Both the horned animal and the fire crab have been given inhibitor potions, which is why their spirits are so poor, and their pupil colors are very strange. I suspect there are parasites in their bodies, and they must be sent back to Hogwarts with their cages. Kettleburn, indeed an old professor who has been teaching for decades, made a judgment on the situation of these magical animals after only a little examination. Under Kettleburn's command, everyone, including Hogg and Kiki, began to help. After a long period of work, they managed to transport a variety of magical creatures out of the E-Cave. 
Apart from the stunned manticore, horned camel, hog, and the thestral, the rest of the magical creatures were brought out in cages. The method of transporting them back was straightforward. First, Hagrid and his flying motorcycle were taken to the outskirts of the Forbidden Forest. Then, Anduin, Kiki, and Kettleburn took turns transporting the magical animals to the same location. Once outside, Hagrid used his flying motorcycle to pull them back. The smaller creatures were loaded directly onto the motorcycle, while the larger ones were levitated and dragged back with ropes. After several trips back and forth, they finally emptied the cave. At Anduin's suggestion, Kettleburn agreed to take credit for discovering the magical animal smugglers, claiming that he, Hagrid, and Anduin had fought off the werewolves together. He also agreed to avoid mentioning Anduin's name to prevent drawing unwanted attention, especially since the werewolf wizard was still at large. Kettleburn stayed behind to call the Aurors from the Ministry of Magic, who would handle the situation with the Department of Magical Creatures Regulation and Control. Anduin, having already made headlines during the summer vacation, preferred to avoid further publicity and potential retaliation. Upon returning to Hogwarts, Anduin, Kiki, and Hagrid spent the afternoon arranging the magical animals. Professor Kettleburn finally finished dealing with the Ministry of Magic by evening. The magical animals had suffered greatly at the hands of the werewolves, and it took a long time to feed, check, and treat them. Anduin decided to let Kiki and Hog temporarily stay in his room at the Forbidden Forest Cabin. Since he usually lived in the Slytherin dormitory and only occasionally stayed at the cabin on weekends, this arrangement worked well. Hogg was pleased with this, although he still needed time to recover from the long-term abuse by the werewolves. Kiki was initially nervous and apprehensive, but under Anduin's guidance, she moved into the cabin obediently. Hagrid was very welcoming to the new tenants. Having lived alone for a long time, he appreciated the company. Over the next few days, Anduin visited the Forbidden Forest cabin in the afternoons when he had no classes. He checked on Hogg's recovery and took Kiki to help Professor Kettleburn and Hagrid care for the magical animals. This experience allowed him to accumulate valuable knowledge in treating magical creatures. End of this chapter. Chapter 233 the inability to cast spells. My lord, take a quick look. Is the meat already cooked or should we continue roasting? Hogg asked excitedly, his tongue hanging out and his mouth full of mist. His eyes were fixed on the stone barbecue grill in front of him. Don't worry, these pieces of meat are cut quite large, so they take longer to cook. You can see that the fat on the meat is still stained with blood, which means it needs a bit more time, Anduin replied glancing helplessly at Hogg before returning his focus to the barbecue. Over the past few months, Hogg had recovered well both physically and mentally. Anduin noticed that although Hogg possessed intelligence comparable to humans, his nature was closer to that of a wolfhound, or perhaps more like an excitable husky. Hogg was often in a state of high excitement, which led to some unintended destruction around the house. His teeth marks were left on many pieces of wood inside and outside the hut, causing Anduin and Hagrid considerable trouble. However, Hogg had a significant advantage. He could easily communicate with small animals and magical creatures. This ability made him invaluable to Hagrid and Professor Kettleburn. With Hogg's help, the treatment of magical animals became much more convenient. After a period of care and recuperation, the rescued magical animals gradually regained their health. At the moment, a cat, a raccoon, two minks, and three hedgehogs were all gathered around, eagerly watching Anduin's barbecue. Other magical animals had either been released after recovery or placed in Professor Kettleburn's breeding park next to the Forbidden Forest. This arrangement made Hagrid so happy that he visited the park almost daily to see the two adorable animals, the horned camel and the manticore. Anduin and Chiki were initially responsible for taking care of these low-risk creatures. Hogg, familiar with animal language, quickly bonded with them. Even after their recovery, these little creatures were reluctant to leave. It took a long time for them to recover, mainly because they had suffered greatly under the werewolves' care. They were not only starved and malnourished, but also infected with various inflammations. To take care of them, Anduin didn't return to Diagon Alley for Christmas and spent the holiday at Hogwarts. 
Charles, Vivian, and others welcomed these magical animals as they diligently trained daily, eager to have time to pet the cats and dogs afterward. Hog had become the leader of this group of animals, taking them on daily adventures. Cheeky, like a concerned mother, always followed behind to clean up after them. Today, an old ream cow had been seriously injured by freezing, so Anduin, Hagrid, and Professor Kettleburn decided to divide it up. They were now cooking barbecue by the oven outside the hut. Whenever Anduin cooked, Hog and his gang of animal friends would gather around, not treating themselves as outsiders at all. By the way, Hog, how's the spellcasting practice I taught you these days? Are you still unable to use spells? Anduin asked as he turned the sizzling barbecue on the skewer, making casual conversation. That's right, my lord. I can't even use the simplest glow spell or levitation spell. Holding a wand in my mouth or claws doesn't help either. It seems I don't have much talent for spellcasting, Hog replied, still staring at the barbecue with his tongue out. He didn't seem too concerned about his inability to cast spells. His parents had tried to teach him spellcasting since he was a child, but it had never worked. Just learning how to speak had already consumed a lot of energy. However, it was different for Anduin because he knew that Hog had magic power within him. After measuring it, he found that Hog's magic power was not insignificant, about 200 ticks. Although this was higher than most wizards of the same age, it was still less than Vivian's. This also highlighted how exceptional Vivian was, even surpassing a dog in magical potential. Having magic power but being unable to cast spells was a topic worth studying for Anduin. Despite extensive research, he struggled to find an answer. Hog's magic power was intact. He had magical sensitivity, mental strength, and willpower. He could speak and chant incantations, so why couldn't he cast spells? In the end, Professor Kettleburn offered some special advice. Due to the different physiological structures of various creatures, there could be deviations in the nature and expression of magic power. The method of chanting and casting spells was a technique human wizards had developed through long-term experimentation. Many humanoid magical creatures, although their spellcasting effects were similar to those of human wizards, had certain deviations. To be honest, it was a bit difficult for Hog to cast spells like a wizard. However, Anduin was still somewhat unwilling to give up. He continued to ask Hog to try casting spells from time to time. It would be a waste if he didn't use his magic power. It's okay, Hog. I've been thinking about other ways recently. Even if you can't cast spells, it doesn't mean you can't use magic, Anduin said with a knowing smile. Uh, my lord, although I don't understand what you mean, you'd better sprinkle the cumin quickly, or the meat will burn, Hog replied, staring intently at the large piece of roasting meat, drooling. You and Cheeky should come to the Forbidden Forest later. I made a piece of equipment for you as a gift, which can also confirm some of my previous thoughts, Anduin said not responding directly to Hog. He knew that during meals, Hog only had eyes for the meat, and he was used to it. Master, does Cheeky have one too? Chichi, who was helping to light the fire, asked in surprise. The little elf had a very different demeanor from when Anduin first met her. She was now wearing the marching uniform Anduin had given her, and her figure had become much stronger, thanks to the meals provided by Anduin and Hog. However, the most significant change was in her spirit. She had lost much of her obsequious and humble demeanor and had become much more courageous. The basic physical training arranged by Anduin, although not as intense as that for Charles and the others, was helpful in tempering her will and strengthening her body. End of this chapter. Chapter 234. The Muscle-Bound Golden Wheel. Mengchichi Anduin was very pleased with this change. It not only signified Kiki's transformation, but also provided him with a deeper understanding of the species of house elves. With Kiki, he could observe, understand, and test more closely. The deep-rooted slave mentality of house elves had always worried him. In fact, house elves have many advantages, such as an innate good magic perception and the ability to cast spells without wands. Although their magical power is somewhat limited, Kiki, for instance, has about 170 ticks, which is at least better than Vivian. Their magic is indeed unique, as Professor Kettleburn mentioned, and the principles of many of their spells are completely different from those of wizards, 
especially their ability to apparate. Even in Hogwarts, which is protected by anti-apparition spells, Kiki can still teleport around, making Anduin envious. Anduin has been trying to understand and learn this principle, but he found that even if the same spell is used, the effect is slightly different. The spells that Kiki can cast do not work for Anduin, and some spells commonly used by wizards cannot be cast by Kiki in the same way. After several attempts, Anduin concluded that it might be due to the different physiques and systems of both parties. It's a pity that house elves tend to suffer in terms of character. They are not weak, but they are naturally oppressed and always changed by their masters. Few house elves change for themselves, possibly because they have been domesticated by wizards for a long time. Although the will training subtly made Kiki bolder and stronger in character, it was still largely dependent on Anduin, and the cowardly nature deep in her heart had not completely changed. Anduin has been trying to change this through communication, education, and training, and finally found that training had a stronger effect. At least now, Kiki has accepted wearing clothes, receiving wages, and occasionally offering her own opinions. If the character defect of house elves can be overcome, does that mean that a batch of fighters who can ignore anti-apparition spells can be trained in batches? Thinking of this, Anduin looked at Kiki with increasing enthusiasm. He planned to use Kiki as an example to train her into a powerful elf warrior. She wouldn't need a magic wand, wouldn't fear anti-apparition spells, and would be well-armed. She would be a special soldier, naturally suited for assassination and infiltration. No matter how secure the enemy's hiding place, she could pierce the enemy's heart like a sharp knife. Imagine the gentle and diligent house elf peeling off her clothes to reveal strong, bronze-colored muscles, then donning a tactical suit with various equipment. Kiki, who instantly became heroic, made Anduin squint in satisfaction, his heart full of anticipation. Master, master, the meat seems to be overcooked, Kiki reminded Anduin, who was lost in thought. Ah, oh sorry. Anduin said, snapping back to reality. He looked down and saw that the beef was indeed overcooked. He quickly sprinkled some seasoning, took it out, and distributed it to the small animals beside him, who were already eagerly waiting. The cat and raccoon were especially impatient, jumping onto Anduin's shoulder like greedy little creatures, meowing and howling. The mink and stinger next to him also rushed towards him, climbing as if they would lose their share if they slowed down. Okay, okay, everyone has a share, don't grab it. Hog, hurry up and take care of your little brothers, Anduin called out, trying to manage the eager little animals. But when he turned his head, Hog's cute face was only five centimeters away, staring at him with a greedy look, clearly waiting for the meat. Hog probably wanted to pounce on it, but was too big and felt embarrassed. After some tossing and turning, Anduin finally managed to distribute the meat to the eager little creatures. After spending quite some time with the group of magical animals, Anduin finally managed to feed them. With that task completed, he turned his attention to Hog and Kiki, leading them into the Forbidden Forest. Once they were beyond the boundaries of Hogwarts, Anduin found a flat area within the forest. My lord, are we conducting another experiment today? We've tried many methods, but I still can't cast a spell. Hog said, his voice tinged with frustration. Having been in contact with Anduin for so long, Hogg knew that his lord was a scientific research enthusiast, always eager to experiment. By now, Hogg had grown accustomed to it. Just because you can't cast a spell doesn't mean your magical power is wasted. Your potential hasn't been fully developed yet, Anduin replied with a reassuring smile. He then pulled out two items from his bag and showed them to Hogg. What's this? A little vest? Hog tilted his head, sniffing the item curiously before looking back at Anduin in confusion. In front of Hog, Anduin held up a vest and a pair of goggles. The vest was similar in color to Hog's fur and appeared quite thick. It had round protrusions resembling metal balls and several small pockets on both sides. This isn't an ordinary vest. It's a tactical vest I've specially prepared for you. It can extract the magic power from your body to cast some spells. Try it on, Anduin explained as he helped Hog into the vest. The vest fit Hog perfectly. Once he had it on, he resembled a military or police dog from the Muggle world. With the goggles on, he looked even more spirited, 
like a police dog ready for action. However, it was amusing to see an era, a breed not typically used as police dogs, in such gear. Mr. Hogg, you look so handsome, Kiki said with a sincere smile, admiring the big dog in front of her. Really? Hogg's excitement was palpable. He jumped up, struck a few poses, and smirked at himself. He then began circling around, trying to get a better look at his new appearance. Without a mirror, he could only tilt his head and spin in one direction. All right, all right. Don't get too carried away. Let me explain the purpose and function of this tactical vest, Anduin said, shaking his head at Hogg's antics. Come on, Lord Anduin. I feel so strong now. Does this little vest increase my strength? I feel like I could kill a cow with one bite, Hogg exclaimed, baring his fangs and acting as if he were about to bite a nearby tree. End of this chapter. Chapter 235, Tactical Vest. I advise you not to do this. It's none of my business if you break your teeth, Anduin said, looking at Hogg's excitement. He kindly reminded him, this tactical vest doesn't increase your strength. It's more of an auxiliary tool to help you use magic power. Oh, then what's the use of it? I don't feel any difference with this little vest, Hogg said, regaining his senses and shaking his head. Anduin thought speechlessly, remembering how Hogg had just sworn that he felt stronger. That's because the equipment hasn't been activated yet. Try channeling your magic power into the goggles in front of you, Anduin explained, lowering his head to support Hogg. Magic power, input, goggles? Hogg followed Anduin's instructions, trying to mobilize his magic power. Suddenly, his eyes lit up. Yes, yes, the corner of the goggles is lighting up. There's a small green light. That's right, it's an equipment warning device. A green light means the equipment is in good condition, a yellow light indicates an overload, and a red light means the equipment is malfunctioning, Anduin explained patiently. And then, my lord? Hogg asked, excitedly wanting to continue experimenting. First, look at the left side of the goggles, Anduin pointed to the left side of Hogg's eyes. There is a row of rune buttons vertically, each representing a function of this equipment. I haven't reproduced many of them so far, so try these first. I'll add more modules for you later. Yeah, Hogg nodded, signaling Anduin to continue. If you want to activate a function, channel your magic power into the corresponding rune button. The first and second runes are for the tracing spell and the echo spell. Your sense of smell is already very sensitive, giving you a unique advantage in tracking. Adding these spells will enhance that ability even further. Anduin signaled Hogg to try it. Following his instructions, Hogg injected magic power into the goggles and soon a different scene appeared before his eyes. Hogg's eyes widened as if he saw some magical and graceful scenery. His mouth and tongue stretched out and he turned around in circles. It's not his fault. When Anduin and Professor Burns first experienced the echo spell, they were shocked too. After a while, Hogg ended the test under Anduin's reminder. How was it? Anduin asked. It's amazing, my lord. I feel like I could play with this all day, Hogg exclaimed. In the future, I'll arrange training for you that combines these spells, such as searching, tracking, digging, and identification. Once you're familiar with them, you can explore the rest of the equipment's functions, Anduin advised kindly. The next spells are the Illusion Charm and the Iron Armor Charm, which provide hiding and protection abilities. These spells require you to output enough magic power in a short period, making them more challenging to use. Give it a try, Anduin encouraged. Having already experienced the equipment's magic, Hogg quickly mobilized his magic power. He looked at Anduin with surprise. I can feel this vest pulling on my magic power, and I can roughly perceive how much is needed and how much is missing. That's right. It's normal for the external charm pendant to be more easily perceived than your own spellcasting. How about it? Can you use it? Anduin asked, taking out the recording board to note the usage data. Yes, it's a bit challenging, but as long as you put in all your magic power, you can activate the spell, Hogg explained. As soon as Hogg finished speaking, Anduin saw the husky in front of him disappear into thin air. Anduin then activated the echo spell and watched as Hogg, now invisible, quietly lowered his body and slowly crept behind Kiki. The pads on Hogg's body muffled any sound he made while moving, so Kiki, still staring at the spot where Hogg had vanished, didn't notice anything unusual. Wow, 
Hog suddenly appeared behind Kiki and howled loudly, causing Kiki to jump more than half a meter into the air. Okay, Hog, this tactical vest is not for sti airing people, Anduin said, rubbing his forehead helplessly. Wow. Hog tilted his head in puzzlement. Shouldn't such an interesting function be used to scare people? All right, since you can activate the illusion curse, the iron armor curse should work too, Anduin said, looking at Hog seriously. After getting confirmation from the husky, he continued. Next, let's do a test. You move around me erratically, activate the disillusionment curse and the iron armor curse, and I'll see how long it takes to hit you under normal conditions. Hog nodded eagerly, ready to play. He quickly disappeared, blending into his surroundings, and then began to move at high speed. His speed was so fast that he almost turned into a blackened blur in Anduin's sight. Anduin's main goal was to test Hogg's basic reaction and physical fitness. Hogg had been undergoing rehabilitation, so Anduin hadn't arranged any training for him until now. He took out his wand and aimed at Hogg, firing a stunning spell. If Hogg continued running at that speed, he would undoubtedly be hit. However, Hogg saw the spell coming and immediately stopped and changed direction, calmly dodging the attack. Oh, it seems his reaction speed is quite good. Let's raise the difficulty, Anduin thought. He fired two more spells, one aimed at Hogg's path, and the other blocking his escape route. Seeing this, Hogg exerted force with his hind legs, leaping more than a meter into the air and easily dodging the spells. Anduin continued to increase the difficulty, firing three spells, then four, and finally using the technique of multiple spells to shoot five in a row. Hogg, moving at high speed, was eventually hit, but the iron armor curse protected him, though he was slightly off balance. Okay, that's the end of the test, Anduin called out, recording various data about Hogg on his clipboard. He was very satisfied with Hogg's performance. With proper training, Hogg had a bright future ahead. End of this chapter. Chapter 236, Attack Module. Next is the Levitation Rune. It has two uses. The first is to cast it on the tactical vest, it can gradually reduce weight and change directions to improve your movement speed and flexibility. At maximum power output, it should allow you to float directly. Give it a try. Activate the fifth rune, and then focus on yourself, Anduin instructed Hogg with a smile. Yes, my lord, Hogg responded eagerly. He was thoroughly enjoying himself. This tactical vest was far more interesting than playing with balls of wool or dealing with racists. Hogg focused his gaze on the fifth rune on the left side of his goggles. Gradually inputting his magic power, he closed his eyes and concentrated on his body. Soon, he felt the small vest on his back slowly rising and his body becoming lighter. When he opened his eyes again, he rushed forward with a whoosh sound. Despite exerting the same amount of force, he moved much faster. With the continuous input of magic power, his speed increased rapidly until... After a single jump, Hogg pushed the magic power to its limit, maximizing the effect of the levitation spell. He floated directly into the air, more than a meter above the ground. However, once airborne, Hogg found himself stuck. He couldn't move at all. Suspended in midair, Hogg looked like a silly dog paddling in water. He soon realized something was wrong and turned to Anduin with a confused expression, as if to ask, What's going on? Uh, it seems that without an external drive, you still can't fly freely after floating. This is my oversight. We'll disable this function for now. You can use it to reduce weight in the future. I still need to study the flight mode, Anduin admitted, rubbing his head in embarrassment. Hogg nodded, then released the magic power supply to the levitation rune. After landing, he played with the levitation rune repeatedly. Although he couldn't fly yet, he still enjoyed the noticeable speed boost. Anduin was relatively satisfied with the results. Although Hogg couldn't gain the ability to fly directly, reducing weight by applying the levitation spell to his equipment was still very meaningful. This could even be applied to himself. Anduin was already familiar with the levitation spell, but he had discovered a characteristic. When cast on a target carrying the rune, movement became difficult. For example, Casting the spell on a tactical vest with a levitation rune made it float, but moving it was very challenging. However, casting the spell on external objects made movement simple. Therefore, casting spells on clothing and equipment to promote weight loss and float in the air was a recent inspiration. 
This wasn't difficult to operate, mainly because he had an extraordinary level levitation spell. He always had a preconceived notion of casting spells directly on himself. The extraordinary level levitation spell was indeed faster than ordinary levitation spells, but it was still difficult to call it flexible and maneuverable. Increasing speed was also challenging, so he thought of finding another way. Now that the test on Hog was successful, it meant he could replicate it for himself. By inscribing the levitation spell on his equipment to reduce weight, he could increase his movement speed in a disguised form and even rely on the equipment to float. Then, using the extraordinary levitation spell to impart kinetic energy to himself might solve the flight problem that had plagued him for a long time. Anduin nodded in satisfaction, then looked at Hog, who was having a great time playing. He quickly called out, Stop playing around. Save some magic power. There are more tests to conduct. Wang! Upon hearing this, Hog immediately rushed to Anduin, his tongue lolling out cheerfully as he panted heavily. It was clear that he was increasingly excited about the little vest he was wearing. Next, we'll test another application of the levitation spell, casting it on external objects. Since it's not convenient for your claws to grab things, you can try using the levitation spell T or control objects. You already have experience with the spell's runes, so this experiment shouldn't be too difficult, Anduin explained, pointing to a stone nearby. Hog, understanding Anduin's instructions, focused on channeling his magic. Thanks to his prior experience with the levitation spell, he managed to lift the large rock Anduin had indicated after a few attempts. Good. Now try moving it, throwing it, and concentrating on your control, Anduin continued to guide. Following Anduin's commands, Hog moved the stone a certain distance and then threw it far ahead. Seeing the successful results, Anduin nodded in satisfaction. Very good. This way, the levitation spell can help you complete many difficult tasks. Remember to practice more. The effect will become more pronounced as you become proficient. Yes, my lord, Hog replied, clearly valuing the spell. In the past, he had to rely on his teeth or claws, but now, with this spell, things were much more convenient. Excellent. Let's move on to the final test, the attack module, Anduin said, his expression becoming serious. Chichi, step back a bit. The next test might be a little dangerous. Chichi immediately ran about 10 meters away. Hog, hearing that there was an attack function, became even more excited. His bright red tongue hung out as he eagerly watched Anduin. The sixth rune is a set of combined runes. When activated, it generates a floating cannon that automatically draws on your magic power to cast attack spells. However, you will need to assist with aiming, Anduin explained. In previous experiments, Anduin had discovered that automatic aiming for the floating cannon was not feasible. There were two main challenges. First, the spells formed by the magic power needed to be concentrated and channeled. Otherwise, it would be difficult to form a spell projectile. Simply put, the barrel didn't work properly. To solve this, there were two options, using equipment like a magic wand to channel the magic power, or relying on the caster's spirit and will to control it, similar to casting spells without a wand. Uncertain about Hog's ability to control magic power, Anduin opted for the simpler method, using a magic wand as the barrel. He used the wand left by Yaxley, which he had modified and shortened. The impact of the previous tests was not particularly significant. The second challenge with the automatic floating cannon was aiming. It was difficult to aim independently and prone to accidental injuries. Anduin's solution was to have the operator assist with aiming, allowing Hog to aim directly. End of this chapter. Chapter 237, Plug-in Magic Source. Come on, Hog, activate the rune, then aim and shoot at the stone you just threw, Anduin directed. Understood, my lord, Hog replied, focusing on controlling the magic power. He began to mobilize and input the spell with intricate patterns. As he did, the fist-sized metal ball on his back floated up, revealing a magic wand slightly longer than the metal ball in front of it. To be honest, the floating cannon looked rather odd like a candied apple lying flat. My lord, there's a spot of light in front of my eyes. Is this for aiming? Hog noticed a crosshair appeared on his goggles, moving freely with his mind control. That's right, for the first test, it's better to be cautious. Aim for three seconds before launching, Anduin reminded him. Yes, my lord, huh? Hog noticed something strange. 
Why did the cursor suddenly turn into a red cross? It was a green cross before. You idiot, Anduin said, rubbing his forehead in exasperation. Your head is raised too high, blocking the muzzle. If you had fired, the first thing you'd hit would be your head. Sure enough, Hogg had instinctively raised his head while focusing on the goggles. Shocked into a cold sweat, he quickly lowered his head and continued to aim carefully. My lord, should I fire now? This posture should be fine, Hogg asked uncertainly. Anduin looked at Hogg, who was now bent over with his head almost touching the ground, feeling very speechless. There was no need to be so afraid of death. He nodded and said, Launch. Rest assured, the power of the spell I added is not very exaggerated. It won't kill anyone if it accidentally injures them. Okay, fire. After receiving a definite answer, Hogg focused on increasing his magic power output. The floating cannon on his back trembled and free electric lights appeared on its surface. With a boom, a silver-blue current laser hit the distant stone in the blink of an eye. Everyone heard a loud bang as the stone was instantly torn apart, with fragments scattering everywhere, some flying more than ten meters away. My lord, do you call this not very powerful? Hogg felt his legs go weak at the sight. If his head had been hit by this spell, wouldn't he have died on the spot? This is just an ordinary cluster lightning spell. When it hits a living body, it has more paralyzing and burning effects. If it doesn't hit a vital point, it would take at least two or three shots to kill a werewolf. Don't worry, Anduin said indifferently. Hogg looked at Anduin speechlessly. A spell that can kill a werewolf in two or three shots. Did he call this normal? Did he underestimate the physique of werewolves? Okay, okay, this test is considered a complete success. Get more familiar with this tactical vest when you have time. This is just a preliminary version. I'll add more plugins in the future, such as apparition spells, loads of throwable talismans, and the like, Anduin said, not paying attention to Hogg's terrified expression. He then shifted his gaze to Cheeky. Cheeky, next is your equipment. Come here. Yes, master. Cheeky jumped up and down excitedly, standing at attention. Anduin took out a similar tactical vest and motioned for her to put it on. After she did so carefully, Anduin explained patiently, Chi-Chi, your magic spell is good, so I won't add any strange functions to your vest. The main functions of this tactical vest are concealment, energy storage, and auxiliary training. After researching Chi-Chi, Anduin found that house elves have excellent magic perception abilities, and their sensitivity to magic is much higher than that of wizards. From the beginning, house elves have been able to cast spells without a wand. Moreover, their efficiency in using magic is surprisingly high. Generally, wizards need five to six ticks to cast a spell, while house elves only need three to four ticks, saving about 30% of their magic power. However, compared to wizards, their mana reserves are still quite limited. The mana reserves in their bodies are roughly one-third of that of ordinary adult wizard, DS, or even less. This is partly due to their short and thin bodies. Additionally, most elves have a slave-like status in wizarding society, making it difficult for them to absorb enough nutrition, which slows the increase in their magic power. Take Kiki, for example. The magic power reserve in her body was only about 150 ticks initially. After several months of being fed by Anduin, it has now reached 170 ticks, but she still appears thin. Therefore, to compensate for this shortcoming before Cheeky's physical fitness and magic power reserves improve, Anduin chose to install an external magic power source. This tactical vest is equipped with nine magic energy storage runes, each capable of storing roughly 20 ticks of magic power, providing a total of 180 ticks of spare magic power. It is also equipped with an energy-absorbing magic circle that can automatically recharge by absorbing free magic energy. Additionally, Cheeky's tactical vest is equipped with the standard Phantom Curse and Iron Armor Curse, which are spells that consume a lot of magic power. The pockets on both sides are enchanted with the No Trace Stretch Curse, making it much more convenient for Cheeky to perform daily housework with the added space. To support her daily training, the vest is also inscribed with the Healing as Before spell. Despite Cheeky's weaker physique, she needs to do a lot of physical training to continue increasing her magic power reserve, and this spell can initiate necessary treatments. After putting on the tactical vest given by Anduin, 
Chi-Chi carefully tested it like Hog did. Under Anduin's guidance, she learned how to extract and use the magic power stored in the vest. Soon, Chi-Chi couldn't put it down and kept fiddling with it. Next, Anduin accompanied Hog and Chiki in the Forbidden Forest to familiarize themselves with the equipment. Afterward, they returned to the hut in the Forbidden Forest. There, Anduin saw a chubby figure sitting on the steps of the hut, stroking a cat. It was Vivian. Vivian's appearance has changed significantly. At the beginning of the school year, Anduin had her eat and drink well for a month to experiment with the effect of energy intake on mana reserves. Vivian welcomed this very much. However, later test results proved that energy intake alone without training had no obvious effect on increasing magic power. End of this chapter. Chapter 238. The Potions Office. Vivian's magic power hadn't increased much, but her weight had skyrocketed. Anduin felt guilty about this outcome, so after a month, he intensified Vivian's training regimen, hoping to help her lose weight. However, with Vivian's love for food and her aversion to rigorous training, she was inconsistent in her efforts. As a result, her magic value barely broke through 200 ticks, while her weight continued to climb. The main issue was that after Anduin rescued several magical animals, he started cooking more food daily. Vivian shamelessly began to steal food meant for these animals. If Anduin hadn't caught her in the act, the animal's recovery would have been much slower. Vivian, weren't you supposed to be on a date with Charles? How do you have time to come here? Anduin asked, puzzled. Since the school year began, Charles and Vivian's relationship had developed rapidly. They spent most of their free time together, and Vivian often used this as an excuse to skip training. We can't stay in Hogsmeade all day. Can't I come over to see if you're here? Hog and Fluffy are hungry and thin, but as soon as I arrived, I found you secretly eating barbecue. Are you hiding something delicious from me? Vivian said, grabbing the cat raccoon she named Fluffy and rubbing it against her face, as if to punish it. The cat raccoon shook its lion-like tail helplessly and looked at Anduin with pleading eyes, as if to say, Why are you just standing there? Save me! Ever since Anduin discovered Vivian's habit of stealing food from the animals, he rarely cooked in front of her, especially meat. Seeing Anduin's embarrassed expression, Vivian glared at him. All you do is steal food. What will you do if this continues? Hog and Fluffy were stunned. Did this girl really have the audacity to speak so confidently? She was the one who did nothing all day, yet she still wanted to scold them. Forget it, I'll let you go today, Vivian said, releasing the poor cat raccoon. The dean asked me to find you. You weren't in the common room, so I got caught. Snape, why is he looking for me? Anduin wondered. Is it because of the promise he lost in a bet last year? Anduin's fourth year had been relatively peaceful, at least at Hogwarts. Yaxley had been imprisoned in Azkaban, and it was said that his mind was now unstable. Travers had been forced to transfer to another school by his mother, Yulia, and the entire Travers family had moved to the European continent to avoid him. As a result, no one in Slytherin dared to trouble Anduin. In fact, the pure-blood wizards in Slytherin were now avoiding him, except for the monthly confessions they were forced to give him. Anduin had no interest in these brats. He preferred to spend his time and energy on research and training, so he enjoyed this ordinary life. Could it be that the dean was looking for trouble again? Anduin shook his head. It didn't make sense to speculate. He needed to meet Snape to understand the situation. After instructing Hog and Fluffy not to use their tactical vests around the hut, Anduin set off for the castle. The students he met on the way no longer stared at him. It had been a long time since the last summer vacation, and Anduin didn't like being in the limelight. He rarely appeared in crowded places, so the students had almost forgotten about his fighting hero reputation. Bang! Bang! Anduin knocked on the door of the potions office in the basement. Who is it? Professor Snape's voice was as deep and slow as ever, carrying a magnetic quality that seemed to push people away. It's me, Anduin replied, his voice equally low and cold. Perhaps it was due to his frequent interactions with Snape that his tone had gradually become similar. Come in. The door is unlocked. Anduin opened the door and stepped inside. The potion office exuded a cold and damp atmosphere. The lighting was dim, but everything was neatly organized. 
There was nothing behind the desk. He turned his head and saw the dean leisurely arranging herbal medicine bottles on a cabinet. It wasn't until Anduin had entered the room and stood still for a moment that Snape slowly turned his head. Still so impolite. Maybe you should learn from your classmates, who at least know how to greet their headmaster, Snape said with a slight sarcasm, raising his head as usual. Dear Dean, if I had greeted you the moment I walked in, I suppose you would now be saying that my lack of propriety disturbed your work, Anduin retorted, a slight smirk playing on his lips. He was well acquainted with Snape's demeanor. No matter what he did, Snape would find fault. Bowing submissively would only earn disdain. Sometimes, being stubborn earned more respect. Hmph. Do you think you're very humorous, daring to joke with the dean? Snape walked slowly behind his desk and sat down. His voice remained gentle and low, but the irony in his tone had lessened. It seemed he wasn't truly angry, but had made a habit of talking back. It's my fault for not understanding the joke the dean made with me earlier, Anduin replied with a slight smile, then sat down across from Snape. Let's get to the point. I don't have time to argue with you. Do you know why I called you here? Snape asked, opening a side drawer and searching for something. Anduin rolled his eyes internally, thinking, as if I enjoy arguing with you. How would I know why you called me here? He looked at Snape blankly and shook his head. Look at this, Snape said, pulling out a folded parchment from the drawer and handing it to Anduin. Anduin took the parchment, unfolded it, and read it carefully. His brow furrowed in confusion. Prefect? Anduin asked, looking up with some difficulty at the expressionless dean in front of him. Chapter 239. Sense of Honor? Yes, next year, I will nominate you as a Slytherin prefect, Snape nodded, looking at Anduin with deep, probing eyes, as if trying to discern something from him. Anduin was puzzled, not by the nomination itself, but by the timing of Snape's announcement. Typically, Prefect appointments are determined after the final exams. The deans of the houses nominate and select candidates, and then the headmaster verifies the choices. The headmaster usually doesn't interfere much with the internal affairs of the houses, so this is mostly a formality. After the headmaster signs off, a letter with the appointment document is sent from the school, and students usually find out about their appointment during the summer vacation. But now, with more than two months left before the end of the term, why was Snape notifying him so early? Moreover, a prefect's responsibilities include helping the dean manage the house, conducting night patrols to ensure no students violate curfew, and deducting points for rule violations. Anduin, who was often elusive and barely recognizable to all the students in Slytherin House, seemed an odd choice for such a role. For someone with such a low profile, was it necessary to appoint him as a prefect? In fact, Anduin himself was somewhat resistant to the idea. Being a prefect would waste a lot of his research time. You decided on the prefect so early, and I'm usually very busy, so I may not have much time to manage the affairs of the house, Anduin tactfully expressed his reluctance to Snape. I know, Snape replied indifferently. I've also heard of your title, Ghost of the Snake Garden. If I hadn't seen Vivian today, I wouldn't have been able to find you. Then why nominate me as a prefect? Anduin tilted his head, trying to understand Snape's reasoning. What do you think of the current state of Slytherin House? Snape asked instead of answering directly. The house is peaceful. Everyone is doing what they like. Except for the occasional friction with Gryffindor, it's pretty good, Anduin replied, though he didn't care much about house affairs. He usually returned to the dormitory after curfew and could go a whole day without seeing a single fellow Slytherin. This month alone, Slytherin lost 200 points due to fights with Gryffindor. You call that a small friction? You can't even tell the difference between Slytherin House and the House? Snape snorted coldly, clearly dissatisfied with the current state of the House. Anduin hadn't paid much attention to House points. He only knew he hadn't lost any points for the house. Of course, even if someone wanted to deduct points from him, they had to be able to find him first. But now Anduin understood what Snape meant. It seemed Snape wanted him to help change the current situation in Slytherin. In that case, why don't you take care of them directly, whether it's giving them orders or urging the current prefects to restrain the students? After all, 
You are the dean, aren't you? Anduin asked, glancing at Snape curiously. It wasn't easy to grasp the authority of the dean to manage the house. You think I don't want to? Snape glared at Anduin angrily. I have a lot of things to do, and I can't manage the house directly right now. And do you think these little snakes will change just by talking? Slytherins have been scattered for too long. The gang led by Yaxley gave them a bad start, making them all think only of themselves, completely ignoring the honor of the house. Snape was clearly frustrated. Dumbledore used him like a white pawn on a chessboard, and he was left to deal with the consequences. Anduin found himself overwhelmed with responsibilities. He had to manage his job, keep up with the Academy's courses, and monitor the movements of the Death Eaters outside the school. Although the rumors were already widespread, there was no way to completely relax. It would take at least one to two years to clean up all the Death Eaters. Last year, in order to cooperate with Dumbledore's plan, they allowed Yaxley and Othesi, our purebloods, to cause chaos in the Academy. The intention was to use Yaxley as bait to capture some Death Eaters, but Anduin thwarted their plans. Although Yaxley had been arrested, the harmful influence of these pure blood factions on Slytherin had not been completely eradicated. The most obvious sign was the current division within the college. Each group had its own agenda. Some pure blood wizards were penalized and sent to detention, while some half blood wizards secretly celebrated. They were already doing well without fighting. In fact, Anduin was partly responsible for this division. He had secretly instigated this split. On the side of the Half-Blood Wizards, he encouraged Velen and Vivian to speak ill of each other. On the side of the Pure-Blood Wizards, he asked Rosier to bully others. Neither group knew of his involvement. Anduin watched silently from behind, waiting for the situation to escalate until Yaxley and the others became overconfident. If Anduin hadn't been manipulating things from behind the scenes, Yaxley and the others wouldn't have dared to go too far. He was well aware of this. So you want me to clean up Slytherin House for you? Anduin asked Snape, his face showing displeasure. It will only take one to two years. When I am free, I will discipline them personally. I have only one request. Bring me back at least one Academy Cup, Snape replied. He still had a deep affection for the Academy. He couldn't bear the fact that every year, Slytherin could only watch others lift the trophy. When he was in school, they could win every one or two years, but since he returned to Hogwarts, Slytherin had been third every year, almost always losing to Gryffindor. If I help you, will it count as fulfilling the bet I lost to you? Anduin asked after a moment of thought. Don't you have any sense of honor and responsibility as a member of Slytherin? Snape looked at him with dissatisfaction, his voice rising. Honor? Responsibility? Hearing these words again, Anduin fell into deep thought. His past honor was in defending his country, and his obligation was to obey orders. But now this country held no affection for him, and he was not willing to bleed for it. The man who gave him orders was long gone. Where was his officer now? Did he even exist in this world anymore? Without his officer, Anduin felt lost. In the beginning, he had no motivation to do anything in this world. Chapter 240 A New Beginning Despite repeatedly reminding himself to adapt to his surroundings, Anduin still instinctively felt out of place. He now only trusted his own strength, protecting himself and the things he valued, and no longer accepted orders from anyone. Unless he had a good relationship with someone and was willing to help for free, everything had a price. Are you so sure that I can bring about changes in Slytherin? Uh, Anduin asked indifferently, ignoring Snape's mention of honor. I can see the changes you've brought to Villain, Ibrahimovic, Charles, and Bill. Except for Vivian, who seems to have only gained more than a dozen pounds, there are actually two Gryffindor students among them. It seems you don't fully consider yourself a member of Slytherin, Snape retorted sarcastically, seeing that Anduin was unmoved. Slytherin? Anduin thought wryly. He had initially wanted to blend in, but the students in the academy seemed unwilling to accept him. Well, since Snape was talking about honor, he would show Slytherin what real honor was. In that case, I agree to your request, Anduin said, his mouth curling into a smile as his eyes sharpened. But since you want me to manage Slytherin, it must be done my way, 
If I take care of it, I won't do it carelessly, and even you can't intervene. It seems you are very confident, Snape replied, a smile playing on his lips. He knew this kid was reliable. Since you trust me, I will give you a perfect answer. I can assure you that the Academy Cup will only appear in the Slytherin common room in the future, Anduin sneered. This was Snape's choice, he shouldn't regret it later. I hope so, Snape said, raising his eyebrows in surprise. This kid really dared to talk big. He hoped Anduin wasn't just bragging. For Anduin, agreeing to Snape's request was partly about fulfilling his bet and repaying the counter-curse of Shen Feng Wu Ying bestowed by Snape. The spell was incredibly effective, with fast attack speed and considerable lethality. It had become his common attack spell. After leaving Snape's office, Anduin carefully considered his next steps. Since he had made the promise, he needed to do his best. He decided to take a good look at the current situation in Slytherin House. Previously, he hadn't cared about it, and Velen, Ibrahimovic, and others rarely talked about it in front of him. Only Vivienne occasionally mentioned some gossip she had heard. This happens to be the busiest time in the common room, so let's start there. Anduin nodded to himself and headed for the Slytherin lounge. As he approached the stone door in the basement, he encountered a female student from the same school, holding a stack of books. She seemed to have just returned from the library. This girl, a year younger than him, was his mixed-race classmate named Mona. Mona was surprised to see Anduin at this time. She nodded stiffly to him and didn't dare to strike up a conversation. Anduin smiled and nodded back, then followed Mona into the common room. Coincidentally, a few students were walking out of the lounge, talking and laughing. Anduin recognized one of the girls immediately. It was Millie Osbert. The students with her were also pure-blood wizards, but not the ones who paid him protection fees every month. When this group of wizards met Mona, they didn't react at all. They neither greeted her nor made eye contact, passing by like strangers. However, when Millie Osbert saw Anduin behind Mona, her face instantly became stiff. She immediately lowered her head, not daring to look at him, and passed by quickly. He rushed out of the stone gate in a desperate manner, almost as if he were fleeing. Am I really that scary? Anduin thought to himself. He shook his head helplessly, recalling how she hadn't appreciated his earlier attempt at a beauty treatment. Without lingering on the thought, he walked into the common room. The Slytherin common room was bustling with activity. Some students were gathered around the coffee table in front of the fireplace, diligently working on the R homework. Others were engrossed in a game of wizard chess by the wall, and the clattering sound of mahjong tiles could be heard from two tables where several young wizards were playing cards. As Anduin entered, all eyes turned towards him, curious and somewhat wary, as if they were observing a rare creature. Many of these students had probably never spoken to him since they started school. They seemed puzzled by his sudden appearance. Unfazed by the attention, Anduin made his way directly to the dormitory without engaging with anyone. The students present didn't dare to approach him. Once inside the dormitory, Anduin cast a disillusionment charm on himself and returned to the common room. He intended to spend some time observing everyone. Although the common room appeared normal, with students engaged in their activities, Anduin's keen eyes noticed a distinct division among them. The young wizards seemed to be grouped into isolated cliques, interacting within their own circles but not with others. It was as if invisible walls separated them, preventing any form of communication. Contrary to his expectations, these groups were not divided strictly by blood status. Instead, Slytherin students were split into various large and small factions. Some were studious, focused on their homework, while others laughed and played games, indifferent to the stares of others. There were groups playing cards and chess, but there was no interaction between these cliques. Any eye contact was fleeting and accompanied by an air of indifference. They treated anyone outside their group as if they were invisible. Anduin took out his record board and began to document his observations, categorizing his findings meticulously. The division within Slytherin is more severe than I anticipated. It seems the impact of last year's turmoil is still lingering. However, this presents an interesting social-ecological experiment, he thought, nodding to himself. 
The current situation piqued his interest greatly. End of this chapter.